all of these guys uh, that are in this portion, right, they will all be smaller than the pivot. And all of these guys here are guaranteed to be larger than the pivot. Why? Well, all of these guys are smaller than this guy. But this guy, because this is a median and we split around the median, all of these guys are smaller than this guy. So all of these guys are smaller than the pivot. All of these guys are um, larger than the pivot. So how big is then the partition? Um, each side of the partition is at least, uh, uh, let's see, how do we compute that? Uh, how many elements do we have? Um, the number of elements is, uh, where is, uh, um, okay, here it is. Uh, how many elements is that? Well, uh, so this is n over five many elements here, divided by two, it's uh, n over 10 many elements, and you have three layers of such elements, so at least three tens are smaller than the pivot, and by the same token, at least, uh, at least three tens are larger than the pivot. So each of the two partitions is at most seven over 10, right? So are you with me? How does the algorithm work? Split it in groups of five. Sort them each group, sort each group. That's all doable in linear time. Recursively call the algorithm to find the pivot that will be the median of the middle ones and split the array into those that are smaller and those that are larger. Now you see that all of these elements must be smaller or equal than the pivot because every element there is smaller or equal than the corresponding middle element here. And this element by definition is smaller or equal than the pivot, smaller than the pivot. So altogether, this is uh, 10, uh, sorry, uh, n over five divided by two is n over 10 times three, three times. So if both the smaller, the parts of the, if you now split all the elements al uh, um, uh, along the pivot, right, uh, relative to the pivot, both sides uh, will have at least three tens uh, of the elements, which means that the other side cannot be larger then seven over 10. So how fast is this algorithm? Well, the runtime is small each, when you have a problem of size n, you reduce it to a problem of size n over five, which is finding the pivot, right? Um, because we apply the algorithm recursively to the middle uh, strip, right? So this will be, to find the pivot is t of n over five, then this cn is the work needed to split the elements into the part bigger than the pivot and smaller uh, than the pivot, and then recursively applying the algorithm to what, whichever is appropriate half. If uh, the number of elements in the, uh, in the partition of the smaller elements is larger than i element, than i, right? Then you will find i element in this partition. If it's large, <coughs> otherwise your element will be in, on the right hand side, but you are no longer looking for the i, but i minus k element, where k is the number of elements in the left hand side. So it's exactly, exactly the same. Let's look at the statement, uh, here is the um, algorithm, partition all elements using, oh, this is continued, sorry. So here it is. Uh, so the algorithm says split the numbers in groups of five. Of course, the last group might contain less than five elements. 
order them by brute force in an increasing order, ah, I should have said here, within each group. So order each group by brute force in an increasing order, right? Uh, then, uh, no, no, no. So here, you, you, there are only five of them. You can do it any way you want. There are five elements. It's not significant. It's not significant. You know, if you, you can simply look, let me find the smallest, put it. Then let me find smallest of the rest, put it. It's kind of silly, but who cares? Uh, because it's only five elements that you have to sort. This is doable in constant time. Uh, sorry? <laughs> you can use any sorting algorithm that you might uh, uh, envision um, <clears throat> uh, for as long as it's uh, uh, deterministic and uh, doesn't involve infinite loops, uh, uh, it will do the job. Okay, so you sort each group, then take the middle elements, the medians of the group, then split all the elements into those that are um, bigger than the pivot and those that are smaller than the pivot uh, and of course the pivot. If phi is equal to k, if you are just lucky, this means the pivot is exactly uh, you, the element you are looking for. Otherwise, uh, if uh, um, i is smaller than k, then the first k element will contain the ith element and you look only at that part of the partition. If it's larger, then, uh, uh, then uh, k, then recursively you select the i minus k element because you threw away k smaller elements and you are looking at i minus k just as the same as in the randomized version. In fact, the algorithm is identical to the randomized version, except that instead of picking pivot at random, you pick the pivot among these middle uh, elements, right, recursively. And lo and behold, uh, uh, then the runtime looks as follows. It's bounded by the work to find the pivot. This is T of n over 5 plus the group in which you will be looking for, it has at most 7n over 10 elements because both groups are at least three times as we saw, right? And then splitting into two groups uh, and curves linear overhead. What's the solution to this recurrence? You show that uh, <coughs> T of n will be smaller than 11 times Cn. Why is this so? Well, you prove it by uh, uh, this form of induction that is very useful. It's a little bit kind of, uh, well, uh, more powerful induction than the one that goes from n into n plus 1. So how, <coughs> um, you, what uh, the regular induction proceeds as follows. You assume you've proved the base case. Uh, your statement is true for n equals 0, say, and then you show that if you assume that the statement is true of n, it must be also true for n plus 1. Well, here you assume that your statement is true for all numbers smaller than n, and you show that it is also true at n. It's easy to see that this is a valid principle. <coughs> and so here we assume that uh, uh, this is true um, uh, so for smaller numbers, so we know that t of n over 5 is smaller than 11c times n over 5, and t of uh, 7n over 10 is smaller than 11c times 7n over 10. If you sum up the, the, uh, the right sides, right, this is 11c n over 5 plus 7n over 10, uh, this is 2n plus 7 is 9n over 10. So if you take the greatest common denominator and you do uh, the calculation, you get that this amounts to 109 over 10, 
right? This will give you 22 uh, plus 11 plus 10. Uh, and so you get, of course, 10, this is 10.9 C times N, which is smaller than 11 C. So um, lo and behold, this, uh, sorry, 11 C times N, I forgot to put N here. So 11 C times N. So assumption that this is true and this is true yields that the same is true of T of N. And lo and behold, you have proof of the theorem. So it's really just a very, um, uh, it's okay, very, very same uh, kind of reasoning as in a randomized quick sort, except that um, instead of uh, choosing the pivot at random, you choose pivot among these medians of the groups by a, recur a recursive call. Okay, so how this, here we assume that all the elements are distinct, right? If it happens that say all elements are equal, right, you are in trouble because the, these estimates no longer <coughs> work. Whatever you choose as a pivot, all the elements will go to the left, all the elements uh, and only one pivot will be uh, left. So how do we fix this problem in an efficient way? Yeah. Uh, and the same trick happens to work for quick sort. Standard quick sort becomes very slow if there are lots of repetitions. So the way to do that is, you can read it at home, it's uh, just this uh, uh, making it robust with respect to um, uh, many repetitions. What is the idea? You compare it with the pivot. Uh, and instead of sending uh, um, all the smaller or equal ones uh, to the left, uh, you take all smaller and when it's equal, one time you send it to the left, next time you send it to the right. Uh, you keep a flag each time you encounter an equal, you flip the flag, and when flag is on, you go to the left, when his flag is off, you go to the right. So in this way, uh, the same elements will be equally split, uh, right, without uh, uh, much loosening the, uh, the loop of, um, of the quick, of, sorry, of, uh, of this uh, partitioning. But that's something really, uh, you read this code, piece of code at home um, because it's really kind of a good technical trick. Okay, now the next thing what we want to do is uh, we do some hashing. Okay, so in order to do hashing, I have no clue where this all comes from. Um, We want to, okay, so what is the simplest for, form of hashing that you know? What's the simplest hash function that we use? Huh? By, a prime By a prime number. Now this is a pretty simple and pretty um, effective way, but it has one drawback. Huh? Okay, so uh, your hash function is uh, h of x is equal to um, to uh, x mod some large number uh, p, right? Uh, where p is prime. Okay, now this function it has actually pretty good performance, but it has one bad feature in the sense that it is not localized. Uh, what does it mean? You would like to have the problem, because you see sometimes you will search maybe not exactly for a particular object, but something that is very close to a particular object. Uh, so you would like to have the property that if two numbers, if two keys are close, uh, their hash values are also close. Uh, 
because then to look for things that are similar to x, you will look, you will hash x and then check the slots that are in the neighborhood of the slot where x get no mapped. Why is this function not local? Why is it possible that two very close elements can have a very different hash value? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So the problem is that one value might be, say, uh, just close to the very top, right? And then, say, the value x plus 2 will be mapped all the way here, right? So this is h of uh, x, and this is, say, h of uh, x plus 2 only. Or if you want, uh, uh, if it's on the very top, then, of course, x plus 1 will be fa far enough. How would you uh, fix this feature? How would you make, without introducing much complications, how would you make it local? Yes. Ah, very good, very clever. So this is, this function goes like this, uh, like this, and then starts from here, right? It wraps, right? You go this way, and then it wraps. Instead of doing that, you do this. You go this way, when you hit the bottom, you start going this way, when you get, hit the bottom, you go this way, right? So now if two numbers are close, you are guaranteed uh, to have the hash values um, close, which is exactly what this gentleman suggests. You essentially find modulus uh, uh, 2p, and then you look whether it's in first half or the second half. So that's a simple fix to a, uh, uh, to a standard hash function. So now we want to do uh, hashing when um, that, uh, that has very high performance and in fact is one of the, well, on this team, um, where is on this, uh, sorry, let me see. Okay, so the next topic is uh, um, universal hashing. How do you make it? Uh, okay, so <coughs> here is the problem. Assume that you are given an assignment, right, to design a hash function. And you do, let me remove at least the hand. Um, you, do, you will self-grade in pairs, uh, testing and grading your partner's implementation. Okay, so you make a hash function, your partner makes a hash function, then you exchange them and you try to see how well the hash function performs. But you were unlucky because your partner is not a very nice one. He wants to win at all possible ways. So what he does, he analyzes your hash function, right? And then figuring out how you hash, he picks a sequence of the worst case, causing your implementation to take in all of n time to search. Right, because he picks uh, the values uh, that will cause lots of collisions. Uh, how would you avoid uh, such a situation? If you know what he is going to do, how would you design your hash function to defeat his uh, trickery? What is, what is the only way that no matter he can see what you are doing and he still cannot, yes. Hashing by probing. Sorry? Hashing by? Hashing by? Probing. by probing. 
Uh, well, it's still the same problem. Yes. What is a cryptographic one? Aha. So um, assume that he has a supercomputer that can invert <laughs> <laughs> that can invert uh, any uh, any kind of uh, function. You have a quantum supercomputer. Okay. So that would do the trick, but. Um, uh, something simpler, you, yes, you just add exactly, so you will use uh, randomization to defeat uh, his, uh, um, you also have like the, li the prime number that's larger than the largest of the uh, well, uh, yeah, well, but this kind of, uh, uh, you know, the you, key, you universe of the keys is humongous compared to yeah. the size of the hash table. So keeping the tables reasonably small, what would you do? The solution is to randomize your hashing. Uh, so you would put, you would pick a hash function randomly in a way that is independent of the keys that are going to be stored. Uh, in this way, no single input would evoke the worst case performance because um, your opponent cannot figure out what hash function uh, will be picked to tailor the inputs uh, for this function. So it guarantees good performance. Of course, when it comes to hashing, you can, of course, always guarantee performance only on average over many runs of your uh, program no matter what his the adversary chooses. So how do you do that? How do you pick uh, at random hash function that you are guaranteed that it will have a good performance? Uh, so you have a finite collection of hash functions that map a given universe of keys into a much smaller range from zero to m minus one. So this family, so H has, consists of a whole bunch of hash functions. Now this family is called a universal family if uh, for each pair of distinct keys, uh, if you pick your hash function at random, probability that they will collide is always the same equals uh, uh, one over M, right? So if you pick your um, hash function at random, probability that any two keys will collide depends only on the, is equal for any pa every pair and it's equal just one over the size of the hash uh, table. So in other words, any pair is uh, equally likely uh, to collide if you pick hash function at random. So how do we, uh, let's see, what do they put next? Uh, uh, okay, so why is uh, such a family uh, desirable? If you have a family of hash functions that is universal, let's see how well it will perform. So let y and z be arbitrary keys. Uh, if you choose your hash function uh, at random, uh, and denote the random variable c of y, z to be one if there is a collision between y and z and zero otherwise. So what is then, if you fix an element, uh, what is the expected value of this random variable c, y, x? Well, that's uh, easy to uh, compute. The expected value is probability of a collision times one plus the complement probability that there is no collision times zero, right? Because the, if there is a collision, the value is one. If there is no collision, the value is zero. So by assumption that the, the <coughs> family is universal for any y and x, uh, probability of the collision is one over m. So you get that the value, expected value of this random variable 
is one over m. If you fix x, then for every y, the, prob the expected value is one over m. So now, assume that with a universal family, you are hashing n key keys into a hash table of size m, right? You want to see for each slot, say the slot that contains x, how many collisions, how many elements will go into the same slot? Well, the total number of collisions that involve key x is, of course, the sum of all random variables, right, when y is not uh, equal to x, c of y x when y is not equal to x. But that's now easy to compute because then the expected value of the number of collisions because expectation is linear, is uh, this value, right? Uh, uh, sum of all the random variables yx when you range with y through n minus one elements, right? Because you are hashing n elements. Uh, and we know that the probability, the expected value of each of these variable is one over m. So you get that the expected value is n minus one over m. Now, if you pick m uh, to be, a say, equal to n, right? If you are picking the size of your hash table to be uh, equal to the number of elements that you expect, then, of course, this will be smaller. This will be equal n minus 1 over n, which is smaller than 1. So the total number of collisions involving any particular x, the expected number of collisions is less than one. So most of the uh, slots will be <coughs> um, uh, collision free or at most say one or two collisions because the expected number of elements in the same slot is uh, that collide with a given element x sitting in that slot is uh, smaller than one. Okay, so now if we choose randomly a hash function h from a universal family of hash functions and hash n keys into a hash table of size m, then the expected number of keys in each slot is uh, n over m. So if uh, n is smaller than the number of slots, then the, uh, you are guaranteed that uh, uh, your hash table will be mostly uh, on average, right? Will be almost collision free. So unless you have chain in the range n less than n. Sorry? Unless you have chain in the between n less than n. Uh, so n is, so we are, uh, taking, you want to hash n keys. Uh, say you want to build a static table, right? Lookup table, right? Uh, you make, if you have n elements to put in the table, it's logical to choose a table that is, say, of size about n. But you want hash function to be likely to distribute keys in such a way that each slot has very few collisions. Well, expected number of collisions uh, in each slot uh, is, uh, um, will be um, smaller than one, right, on average. So on average, each slot will contain few elements, but if you really want to, so what we would like to do for static tables uh, is we would like to have a totally collision-free table. Now, if expected number is small, what do you think, what is the probability that there will be a lot of collisions? You see, we will see that low expected value can be kind of traded off for low probability to have lots of collisions, which means if you randomly try to find your table by doing trial and error, probability to f make consecutive failures a uh, large number of consecutive failures will be small. And that's the trick that we are going to employ uh, because our ultimate goal is to, com is to design a static table that is completely collision-free, 
right? Say you want to hash n elements into a table of size n with a simply computable hash function. Uh, and you want to make sure that there will be no collisions. So this is um, our goal. So, so what we can do is choose the size m of hash table to be a prime number. And now we do the following trick that appears in gazillion of other constructions, right? And it is essentially kind of a trick of collapsing dimensionality because high dimension objects are difficult to deal with and so uh, it is used in databases uh, um, and uh, lots of other um, applications. So what we are going to do now it's essentially the method of random projections. Idea is if you have a high dimensional object and you want to hash it and you want to hash it in a localized way, what you do is you pick uh, n vectors that are almost orthogonal and you project your vector to these n vectors and the projections, the tuple of projections will be your uh, hash value. Now, how do we find n uh, linearly independent vector, vectors in a vector space of very large dimensionality? Now, amazing thing happens. So just assume a very, very long vector and assume you generate it randomly and you take another very long vector again generated randomly. What do you think? Is it likely that these two vectors will be orthogonal? What does it mean that they are orthogonal? What's the scalar product of two vectors? Assume that uh, the values are equally likely, say, from minus k to k. So the, your values, the coordinates are all are of the form uh, mi when i goes from 1 to some very large number m um, and say uh, each mi goes between minus some number l and uh, plus l. So I take two vectors v uh, i and v j and I find their dot product. What is dot product of two vectors? Well that's simply sum i equals from 1 to m, um, m, uh, well, not i, let's say k. Uh, so the k coordinate v i and then k coordinate times v j times k coordinate, right? What's the likely value of this uh, sum if uh, the coordinates are chosen randomly and range between, say, uniformly between minus i and l? What do you think? Well, this can be positive or negative. It's a sum of numbers that if they are of the same sign, it will be positive. If they are of opposite sign, it will be negative. What's the probability that they are of the same sign versus probability that they are of opposite sign? Half and half. So about equal number of these guys will be positive, equal number negative, and their values will be, well, that's a little bit tricky now, but uniformly distributed with respect to zero, right? So this value it will be very close to zero. And that's used in database, in hash function designs. If, you, if your space is of high dimensionality, picking at random two vectors, uh, they are almost guaranteed to be uh, mutually orthogonal, which is an amazingly useful uh, property. So what happened here? Why is it go? Um, sorry. So let's see how we, we use the same idea here, namely to, uh, we will use, we are out of time, but we will use a randomized 
we will simply project, um, we will represent R in basis M and then project uh, uh, this vector of coordinates to a random vector. Uh, and we will show that uh, this function, if you obtain uh, your uh, universal uh, set of universe, universal set of functions in that way that uh, lo and behold uh, the family will be really universal so the probability of any two collisions will be uh, 1 over m so this we will do next time uh, please read the notes the material will become trickier and trickier uh,